Shalom, shalom to everyone watching in our live study today. And those who will be watching later, peace and blessings to you. I appreciate you guys for tuning in. Uh, being, being an encouragement, constantly studying. <coughs> And wanting to grow and uh, using these supp these studies as supplements more than more than anything. So I appreciate you guys. Make sure you're you got your word on you with you laptop, whatever you need to look up these scriptures with me. In about 20, 20 seconds or so, 20 to 30 seconds, we'll go ahead and pray in. And, um, yeah. All right, y'all. So I'm on this Wi-Fi. Greetings, greetings. All right, let me see if I can. Uh... All right, so I'm gonna just leave this here for right now, with the with the picture. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and pray, and um, I'll go ahead and get started. Dear Abba. Dear Abahaya, we thank you so much just for your love, for your grace, for your mercy, for your character, for your wisdom, for your fear, for your righteousness, for all the things that we need in us to be a part of you, to continue to walk in you. Um, I ask that you continue to um, cover us, continue to bless us with your understanding, continue to um, breathe into us all the things that um, we need in order to walk, literally walk in the life, in the in the life that you've breathed into us, um, that we were that we were given in the beginning, the purity of all things that you were given to us, giving to us in the beginning. Uh, we ask that you just continue to put us back on that, um, on that straight and narrow path and keep us on that path consistently that we may use these things that you're given to us to be able to um, be sown into good soil. And that way we are not just hearing, but we are doers of this word. We ask that you continue to allow us to um, be joyous with your word, enjoy this walk, enjoy the journey. But we also ask that um, we take more discipline in our, uh, we have more discipline in our walk. We have more seriousness as well um, with this, within the fear and the reverence that we have for you. But we ask that you just continue to still allow us to be thankful, allow us to have peace and joy in your in this walk as we are serious and held accountable and and being responsible uh, with our daily things that we're doing in you to continue to rise in our growth in you. Um, and we ask that you, uh, that you, um, whom some call Yasha, who some call Yahusha, who, um, son, son of the most high, we ask that you continue to, uh, feed into us for we will see you one day or we will, um, um, for you will gather us one day, uh, for those who are, um, deemed as righteous. We ask that you just continue to mold us into the ones that, um, you said that the father gave to you. We ask that you continue to mold us as yourself, as, as uh, we look just like you, um, and that you continue to um, be that intercessor for us that you are, that you continue to um, um, put us aligned in the path that only through you can we actually do anything. And we just ask that you continue to look upon us and uh, give us your mercy and your grace, um, and that you give us the wisdom that is within you that you given to us in our spirit, in our Ruach. 
And uh, we ask for your forgiveness of all things. We ask that you continue to remove anything in our pathway, in our mind, in our heart, to be able to receive from you that is not from me, that is from you ultimately, and that we use these things to be able to gain, gain in more fervor and more passion and more strength in you, in your rock, in your spirit, to be able to go uh, search out the scriptures and learn and, 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 and grow ultimately. And we just give you all the praise, glory, and honor in the name of your son, Abba, we pray. Amen. 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 All right, y'all. So in and out, um, my screen is going to shake here and there. I will be picking it up here and there because of the charging situation of my phone. But ultimately, we are here. We are here. This is the first study uh, of out of two for today or this one today. And then tomorrow we have another one. With great labor, I have, I'm just kidding. Uh, yeah, it, I mean, it takes some labor to put these studies together, but uh, still pretty awesome um, to learn and to grow in. So without further ado, welcome to Spiritual Warfare 1.3, Know Your Enemy, Part 2. That's such a long and interesting title. But it's all good. And let's see here. All right. So let's see what my first slide is. All right. So quick recap. Um, let's see here. We're going to go back through. So some of you guys may have not have been a part of the fruits of the wisdom uh, study or maybe you haven't seen it. So some of that, some of those scriptures and some of the understanding that we got from that um, study is going to come up actually today. So but if you did watch it, you'll kind of remember and, you know, see why we're, we're talking about that. But in the spiritual warfare 1.2, um, that was the first part of knowing your enemy, right? So we read a lot about the, the some of the some of the details in the testaments, especially. Um, we we visited some understanding about sin because we understood that with the connections, right? With the with the uh, connection that we have with demons basically in that uh soul tie that we talked about that ultimately sin has everything to do with it uh we saw that the fallen angels obviously they sin and with the um soul tie that they had to the women that they married and they ultimately had children who whom are the giants or they're called giants or nephilim um their spirits when they died eventually became demons because they have a connection with heavenly beings and also with men. So we saw how they terrorize men. They constantly, um, they don't eat their, their <laughs> mission is to terrorize, is to destroy, is to attack, um, people, all people, even if you're not in the most high, if you're not following the most high, their journey and their goal is to still attack, is to still keep you in a darkness. So uh, we talked about sin and we talked about the sin of commission, which ultimately we saw some. Um, and I could actually pull up some of these uh, these pictures. Hopefully it's easy because I, I have like trillions of screenshots. So if it's not easy. <laughs> to find it yeah it's not gonna be that easy to find ah. give me a couple seconds if i can't find it on here yeah oh there it is i'm probably gonna have to scroll back all the way down 
So we talked about the sins of commission and omission, right? So commission and omission, you both, both of those, you do receive instructions of some kind, which is obviously of the most highest instructions on what to do and what not to do. And within commission, you're doing things that you, you, you did something, you sinned and you shouldn't have, right? And then with omission, we talked about the sins that um, you should have did something and that you actually didn't do, but you still receive the instructions, right? So we talked about the Hebraic understanding of repentance. Um, so we looked into that and then we went into the conscious and the subconscious mind and what that had to do with uh, the enemy being able to ultimately disrupt different things in your heart, in your mind, and play those type of games, especially when it comes down to demonic possession and it comes down to demonic attacks, right? So, um, and then we were also able to find scriptures on that because we also said that just because the world has different concepts that have some validity doesn't mean that we dive so far into the worldly type of concepts, um, there's at a certain point, you'll see it goes far off the grid where it's too much towards a certain type of doctrine that they'll um, go into that obviously the enemy has already touched on and, you know, all that stuff. So when it comes down to that, we did find a lot of scriptures when it comes down to it. So um, that was awesome being able to see into that. And then we talked about the spirit of error, which was ultimately the biggest spirit within the testaments that the patriarchs were actually sharing about. And we, we talked about how those different spirits within the spirit of error, we got to see um, more of that connection. So I'll bring up that chart again in my uh, crazy amount of screenshots. I got to scroll through let's see here i should have just took screenshots earlier uh just so i could have them at the top of my screen all right so we talked about this so we had this little chart um you know that you obviously can use as a reference to build on but we talked about the spirit of error right and then how there was the testaments or patriarchs were speaking on different spirits that come from the spirit of error and uh, it just matched up with scriptures, other scriptures. And we just, you know, was able to get like a like a, a awesome amount of detail. So we talked about that. And what else in our little recap? And yeah, so that's a little short story <laughs> on our recap. So what we're doing today is still building another framework to see more about knowing our enemy. Right. So before we were, were able to even get into the spiritual warfare weapons, you have to know how, what weapons actually, you know, you can actually utilize against the enemy. But when you don't know the diff different things about your enemy, then ultimately you could also end up getting beat. Right. You could end up losing a war, losing uh, many battles because of the fact that. The Most High, the Son, the Word actually reveals so much about the enemy that we need to know on a conscious and subconscious level, right? Within our Ruach, within our spirit to be able to understand when we're engaged in battle, engaged in warfare, which is our everyday uh, with this flesh that we have on um, and within the people that we're in, engaging with within this world that we're engaging with. Um, whether the things that we can see or not see um, spiritually, right? Um, which we talked about that in another study. In that first one, uh, we have to be able to know how to do these things and go about our walk. So that way we're adding to our spiritual discernment ultimately, which is being able to be disciplined in wisdom, right? Disciplined in wisdom to see to hear, using our senses, using, um, you know, the, obviously the scriptures and our understanding, uh, what's also in his spirit, right? Understanding knowledge, um, uh, uh, power, right? So 
we're essentially we're getting equipped to understand our enemy again in this study so that way we can have more of a uh built discernment and i think today will be awesome um because i think your eyes will be a lot more open our eyes will be more open to being able to see and catch different things all right so that was my little introduction to our study our study today and let me get the new screenshot here all right so spirit of error error um we're gonna kind of go through a little bit so you you guys know we we build uh we do a little build up and so for this one, interestingly enough, the buildup isn't going to be so long because we're actually going to actually be reading into the buildup, into the framework, into the foundations that we're that we're establishing. So we're going to jump right into it right after this screenshot here. But I wanted to kind of go through um, some things about the enemy. Right. So we're, we're knowing our enemy. We're understanding what's going on. And some of you guys have read these scriptures and everything like that, but it's 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 going to connect a little bit more today. So go to Ezekiel chapter 28. Ezekiel chapter 28. So this is kind of like a um, a buildup of uh, seeing basically where the spirit of error, how it's how it's developed just in a general, you know, foundational sense. So I'm going to read from, I'll just go ESV. Okay, so Ezekiel chapter 28. So typically, um, I would read from verse 12, but we need to read from verse 1. And then we'll get a little bit better understanding too. All right, so Ezekiel chapter 28. The word of the Most High came to me. This is to Ezekiel, son of man, say to the prince of Tyre, thus says the most high, because your heart is proud and you have said, I am a God. I sit in the seat of the gods in the heart of the seas. Yet you are but a man and no God. OK, a man is not a God, a man and no God, though you make your heart like the heart of a God, you are indeed wiser than Daniel. Um, no secret is hidden from you. So right there, it shows that men, ultimately, and we talked about this in the last study, that breath of life, and we're gonna, I think it's going to come up again. Um, we were given wisdom as men. Uh, you know, uh, man, Adam was given that breath of life, which was wisdom. And obviously, ultimately, Eve gets that breath as well, since she's from Adam. Um, and anything that the most high has created essentially has that same wisdom in it because that was wisdom we understand was there we talked about that in the fruits of wisdom as well um wisdom was there obviously within the sun and the sun is wisdom and um the wisdom is obviously in the father and in the rock so it's showing yes men all men were created with wisdom of the father and um, even when you go read Romans chapter one, right, 18 through 32, you see that they had wisdom, but they changed that wisdom into praising false gods, into idolatry, um, into et cetera, et cetera. And the most high gave them over to their lust, to their choices. OK, so let's continue. Uh, Verse four, by your wisdom and your understanding, you have made wealth for yourself and have gathered gold and silver into your treasuries. By your great wisdom in your trade, you have increased your wealth and your heart has become proud in your wealth. So remember, we're still always searching for patterns, looking at patterns. And the more you read and the more you understand, you start seeing all these different words that start coming up constantly over and over again. And you start being able to, to connect typically everything. Verse six, therefore, thus says the most high, because you because you make your heart like the heart of a God. Therefore, behold, I will bring foreigners upon you, the most ruthless of nations, and they shall draw their swords against the beauty of your wisdom and defile your splendor. They shall thrust you down into the pit and you shall die the death of the slain in the heart of the seas. 
will you still say I am a God in the presence of those who kill you? Though you are but a man and no God in the hands of those who slay you, you shall die the death of the uncircumcised, but the hand of the foreigners for I have spoken declares the most high. So we see here he's the, uh, the father is talking to a man that has put himself up as a God, right? And so in the next section, he's talking to the spirit behind this king, who is actually whom we call Satan. Um, I've been saying he's more so Matsima. That can be debated if you want, um, in the sense of like saying like, okay, maybe that's not specifically the name, because in Enoch, it does say that there's like multiple Satans because Satan is a name or a word for enemy. Um, there's a specific uh, fallen angel that was the actual serpent who beguiled Eve. Eve, you can look it up. Um, it was, I think his name was Gadriel. So he was used to beguile Eve, but ultimately Matsima is the one over the demons. And we talked about that in the first study. He's the one over the demons because he asked for permission to actually rule over one tenth of the demons, one tenth. And the rest of the the nine out of ten is they're in condemnation. They're in the abyss. They're in the place of condemnation in the abyss. Um, so he only asked for one tenth and for him to be able to exert his will through those demons. So that way his will could also be extended to be able to hurt men ultimately because that was his main plan though simjaza in the enoch book of enoch the the main angel who created that oath between the fallen angels uh to rebel you have to remember the main main leader matsima he's not really seen in there right um because he had already committed that spirit of of, of or he had already committed that rebellion before that even happened, so they had to have gotten that from somewhere, right? That that inspiration from somewhere. So it's a good thing to kind of like look through that as well to kind of see that you know that development happen. So that's why I say Matsima. Um, so Matsima or Satan is going to be directly talked to behind who is the spirit of the error behind this king of Tyre, okay? And um, let's see here. Um, wisdom understanding. Let's make sure I just had, I didn't have the same thing else. Um, yeah. Okay. So let's go ahead and read verse 11. Moreover, the word of the Most High came to me. Son of man, raise a lamentation over the king of Tyre and say to him, thus says the father. So notice it's directly going to say he's still talking to king of Tyre, but it's a different message. Like I'm saying to be able to talk to the spirit behind this specific king. It says you were I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And this is also how you verify this. You can connect it with Ephesians six. OK, Ephesians six. There's other scriptures you can connect to that talks about um, demons or fallen angels, however you may say it, um, that are over different countries or different uh, kings and rulers, right? It, there's, a, there's a different um, scriptures you can find for that. But within Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, it says our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms, realms. Right. So um, going back to Ezekiel chapter 28, you can easily see once we read it that he's talking to Matsima. He's talking to Satan, who is a spiritual power, who's this, who's who's ruling behind this specific king and any other kings he chose or any other demons that he put in place, but specifically Matt Sima is the one behind this king. Okay. Uh, so let's go to yeah verse 11 B. It says you were the signet of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. So not only was, 
You, I mean, you see easily. Going back to our Fruits of Wisdom uh, study that we did, even Satan, even Matsima had wisdom. You were in Eden, the garden of the Father or the Son, every posh and the Son. Every precious stone was your covering. Sardius, topaz, and diamond, beryl, onyx, and jasper, sapphire, emerald, carbon coal, and crafted in gold were your settings and your engravings. I'm reading from the ESV. On the day that you were created, they were prepared. You were an anointed guardian cherub. I placed you. You were on the holy mountain of the, of the Father. In the midst of the stones of fire, you walked. You were blameless in all your ways from the day you were created till unrighteousness was found in you. In the abundance of your trade, you were filled with violence in your midst and you sinned. So I cast you as a profane thing from the mountain of the most high and I destroyed you, O guardian cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Uh, quick note, isn't it interesting? Um, we talked about this in the, in the Fruits of Wisdom and just in general, if you guys understand and know, um, you know, in your own studies, when you see the word Shamar, right, and um, Natsar, meaning to guard, right, guarding the commandments, guarding your walk, being able to watch, obviously, for the signs of the times, but also watch what you're doing or watch the fruits of your labor within wisdom and et cetera, et cetera. Um, it's interesting the one who was in the spirit of error, the first one who was in the spirit of error, um, whom had the wisdom of the father, of the father and the son, uh, he ultimately um, is is uh, a guard. He was a guardian. He was a guardian of guardian of the things of the Most High, because he was a, an anointed cherub. He was he had a a, a high position. Um, as a one of the guardian angels of the things of the most high. So as he's walking on these stones of fire, he's seeing all the things of the most high, seeing all the things that have have are heavenly and um, on the earth. I mean, he's literally supposed to be guarding, guarding it. So it's interesting how he would come straight to the most high's creation, whom we are who he put directly that same um task in us to guard if the first thing to guard was the garden of eden right as a gardener um so it's an interesting connection to see his whole purpose is to destroy us from being a guardian of his word which is which is very interesting well let's continue Verse 17, your heart was proud because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. I cast you to the ground. I exposed you before kings to feast their eyes on you. By the multitudes of your iniquities and the unrighteousness of your trade, you profaned your sanctuaries. So I brought, brought fire out from your midst. It consumed you. And I turned you to ashes on the earth in the sight of all who saw you. All who know you among the peoples are appalled at you. You have come to a dreadful end and you shall be no more forever. OK, so um, you read that. That was a very detailed description of your enemy. Right. So let's go to Isaiah. Chapter 14. Chapter 14, and we're going to go to verse 12. So I'm reading from the ESV. How you are fallen from heaven, O day star, son of dawn. How you are cut down to the ground, you who laid the nations low. You said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven above the stars of the Father. I will set my throne on high. I will sit on the mount of assembly in the far reaches of the north. Uh, we did read some of that also in, in Enoch, where he talked about the different things that he saw. Um, in the north, spiritually, right, and just fit like literally, it was both physical and spiritual. The different trees and the different, just beautiful, amazing, righteous things. Um, so he wanted essentially to uh, sit his throne, his his power, his authority. The enemy wants to sit his power and authority over the things of the Father, even that was things that were in the north. Um, 
Verse 14, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. If he would have really had the true wisdom, he would have already understood that he was already in the image of the most high. But spirit of error. Verse 15, but you are brought down to Sheol to the far reaches of the pit. Those who see you will stare at you and ponder over you. Is this the man who made the earth tremble, who shook kingdoms, who made the world like a desert and overthrew its cities and who did not let his prisoners go home? All the kings of the nations lie in glory, each in his own tomb. But you are cast out away from your grave like a loathed branch. We talked about that before in the wisdom series. I mean, in the fruits of wisdom last week. Clothed with the slain, those pierced by the sword who go down to the stones of the pit like a dead body trampled underfoot. You will not be joined with them in burial because you have destroyed your land. You have slain your people. So this is the interesting note that just came to me, too. Um, notice how it's also talking about people are like when they see eventually like see Matsima, they're like, this is the one who made the earth tremble and shook kingdoms or whatever. It's interesting to note that when he asked the most high for one tenth of the demons, um, um, I, I would assume that he chose which ones he wanted and, um, you know, or the most high just gave it to him. Right. Because he actually granted him that request. But it's interesting to see that also. Um, where was my thought? Also, that he probably requested it because he couldn't actually have control over the full 10 right the 10 out of 10 he, he i don't think he really could have actually controlled it controlled it and i say that because um there's a scripture that says um the like the house or the the enemy the kingdom of the enemy cannot stand because the house divided right so let me pull that scripture up a house divided cannot stand. So that's Matthew 12, 22 through 28. All right. And I'm only going to read verse 25. It says, but Yasha or whom some call Yasha, Messiah Yasha, um, knew their thoughts and said to them, every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation and every city or house divided against itself will not stand. If Satan casts out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then will his kingdom stand? If I cast out demons by Beelzebub, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore, they shall be your judges. But if I cast out demons by the spirit of the father, surely the kingdom of the father has come upon you. So his kingdom is already divided because obviously every demon is going to have itself, you know, it's going to have its jurisdictions, but he's still over those demons that specifically. Um, he and one tenth to us, um, you know, to just a worldly or uh, fleshly mind may not really fathom how many demons that could have been. That could have been a thousand, could have been a million. <laughs> uh, you just literally never know. There is no count on how many giants there were um, and how many, um, you know, giants were produced by each woman that the fallen angels were with. There's a lot of fallen angels. I think it was like over 20. And um, I think even some of those fallen angels, it says in Enoch that they also had rule over uh, some of the ones that were under under them. Like they had rank. It was like a ranking system. So who's to say that those other demons underneath the, the main fallen angels who committed what they committed didn't go out and go get wives as well and produce giants. So therefore, you would have a lot of giants in the earth and it would be that much more um, spirits that ultimately. And when they when their giants died, that you would have that many more spirits, um, you know, within all of the demons that, that you know since they become demons you have that many more demons um and who knows for exactly you know obviously there's a certain period of time too so i mean 110 that's that's <laughs> i don't think it was literally a, a, a small amount right so 
there's a division there, but he's Satan, Maxim is still over whom he asks to be over, right? So that's a little bit on on that. So let's go to the Targum. I don't really read from the Targum as much. Please be careful when you're reading it. Um, there's things in it that are connected to, you know, rabbis and their commentary or things that they may have inserted into it. Um, and there are some things, obviously, that are, have validity into it. But still be careful. Still make sure you connect scriptures together. Um, it's not necessarily my recommendation to just have that as the um, only reading or the main reading that you have for the scriptures. Please be careful. But um, I typically read this one from the Targum because it's it's has really good validity to everything else that I, um, you know, obviously to whatever study that we may have that day. So I'm going to read Genesis chapter three in the Targum. OK, Targum Jonathan for this one. All right. And this is still connecting with the spirit of error. OK, so it says, and the serpent was wiser unto evil than all the beasts of the field, which the most high made. And he said to the woman, is it truth that the most high hath said you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent from the rest of the fruits of the trees of the garden, we have power to eat. So once you start getting more understanding, you start seeing how all these different things connect. Uh, but of the fruit of the tree, which is in the midst of the garden, the father said, you shall not eat of it, not nor approach it, lest you die. In that hour, the serpent uh, spake accusation against his creator and said to the woman, dying, you will not die. For every artificer hated the son of his art. For it is manifest that the most high that in the day that you eat of it, you will be as the great angels who are wise to know between good and evil. The woman beheld Sam, uh, Samel, which was the angel of death, uh, and was afraid, yet she knew that the tree was good to eat and that it was medicine for the enlightenment of the eyes and desirable tree by means of which to understand. See that? So it's interesting that wisdom wasn't developed uh, fully in Adam and Eve. Um, and notice that was the breath of life within them. And you go to Jubilees chapter three, and you see that, um, they were actually in the garden tilling that garden for seven years completely. And after that seventh year on that first day, right after that seventh year was done, um, this is when this story actually starts happening. And notice too, in that same chapter, you'll see Adam, it took them 40 days. The angels were giving him instructions for 40 days before they actually took him into the Garden of Eden. And you can obviously connect that with Genesis, where you see that Adam was created outside of the Garden of Eden in another area. Then he was placed in the Garden of Eden. That's symbolic as well. Um, and then Eve was also she was given 80 days. So she was given 40 plus more days than Adam. <laughs> um, and um, Matsima, the enemy, knew who to go to first, interestingly enough. So let's continue. Um, and like I said, be careful with the Targums. Make sure you're reading it. I typically only am, usually read this chapter, but, um, you know, obviously be careful. Make sure it connects. Um, this one has a lot of validity. That's why I'm reading it. All right. So uh, I think this is verse six. Um, she knew that it, the tree was good to eat and that it was medicine for the enlightenment of the eyes and desirable tree by means of which to understand. And she took of its fruit and did eat and she gave it to her husband with her and did eat. So you notice there's a spirit of error there because the one who is provoking her to see what she saw and to change her mindset of actually following righteousness uh, was the one who already had the spirit of error in him and the spirit of error stays in him who is the enemy. So he's basically given that same spirit over to Eve and um, she gave it to her husband and which her husband sitting there right with her went ahead and eat, ate it 
And when you go look into the words, when it says uh, Adam hearkened into her voice, or you'll see Abraham hearkened into Sarah when Sarah was like, yeah, go ahead, just impregnate one of the um, uh, the maidens um, since, since I can't, so she thought she couldn't um, produce a child and he hearkened into her voice, right? So you look into that word, essentially it's meaning like I, like you're, you're leaving whatever st- state of understanding or righteousness that you were walking in in a straight path let's say and you hearken and you give yourself over to something another instruction right so adam hearkens into her voice and to her action and he gives himself over to unrighteousness and to another instruction than he was actually given it'll be interesting to see or you can't even see it because it doesn't make any sense but what if he didn't eat what if? <laughs> but no, you get into those uh, crazy false narratives about Lilith, Lilith being another wife he had there and all that stuff. It's, you got to be careful with this stuff. <laughs> so let me continue. Um, and their eyes of both were enlightened and they knew that they were naked, divested of purple robe in which they had been created. And they saw the sight of their shame and sold to themselves the leaves of figs and made themselves kinctures. So there's another connection with the fruits of wisdom, the figs that they sold together. Very interesting. And they heard the voice of the word of the most high walking in the garden in the repulse of the day. We know who that is, the son. And Adam, and his wife, hid themselves from, uh, before the before the son among the trees of the garden. And the most high or the sons called to Adam and said to him, is not all the world which I have made manifest before me, the darkness as the light? And how hast thou thought in thine heart to hide from before me? Very Another very awesome key for those who really like, you know, want to keep these little keys. The darkness as the light. Very interesting. So when the Most High created, before he, you know, started that first creation, quote unquote, in the beginning, uh, like Genesis chapter 1, you notice it says in the beginning, uh, let me read it verbatim. Let me read it verbatim. So I'm not going to go into it, but it's like, it's a good little key. In the beginning, the most high created the earth of the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void and darkness was on the face of the deep. And the spirit of the most high was hovering over the face of the waters. All right. So real cool connection when he's saying uh, is not all the world which I have made manifest before me the darkness as the light. This is another connection um, here to look up. This one actually helped me not be afraid of the dark when I was younger. Um, let me see here. Because you see all those scary movies, right? And it talks about... Um, you know, everything is always darkness, right? <laughs> always, these spirits are always dwelling in darkness. That's another trick of the enemy as well that turned the narrative for that. To make us feel like there's darkness, like like the enemy is only, I mean, the you know, that darkness is always about the enemy. So the scripture is, was it Isaiah? Or 1 Kings 8.12. It says the most high has said that he will dwell in a dark cloud or in darkness. OK, and so it's symbolic also when you're talking about when you start looking up the temple, right? The temple, the most high was behind a curtain or his presence was behind a curtain. And the Ark of the Covenant, which had the word in it, the, the Torah was also behind that same curtain. Um, and essentially it would be dark, but also you notice when. Uh, Moses was receiving the commandments and the the wisdom and the understanding. That's also within he when he got jubilees as well, um, and he wrote jubilees that there was a dark cloud covering that mountain, right? Which is the mountain of the Most High. So you see a lot that has to do with darkness that isn't um, evil, right? And that includes the dark moon, right? The dark moon is not all is not about evil. There's some some symbolism that will be there, but everything that you have to like make it make sense. You can't change a whole narrative 
to make something about darkness when it's not always about that. Um, so I think this is a great connection here on uh, chapter three of Genesis to show, you know, think about and connect more scriptures with what it says about the darkness as a light. Um, so let's continue. Uh, the place where thou art concealed, do I not see? Where are the commandments that I commanded thee? Um, yes, sir. Mm hmm. Um, very good scripture. Um, you said the voice of thy word. I heard I in the garden and I was afraid because I am naked. This is uh, Eve or Adam saying and the commandment which thou didst teach me. I have transgressed before. I, uh, therefore, I hid myself. So it's showing you he's telling you spirit of error. I was in error. I like I, I have I'm, I'm literally in the wrong mindset or I see different things now that I wasn't seeing. Um I transgressed your, your word. I didn't follow it. And then the son says, who showed you you were naked unless you've eaten of the fruit of the tree, which I commanded that you shouldn't eat. And then he <laughs> goes on to say the woman that you gave with me, gave me the fruit of the tree and I did eat. So then there's more spirit of error. Right. So we saw how it connects with the last study that there's spirits within spirits. Right. Or there's different uh, structure of it. But then you see here, he's blaming. There's a blame game now, right? Um, and then the son says to the woman, what have you done? And the woman says, well, the serpent beguiled me with his subtility and deceived me with his wickedness. And I ate and I cons and I did what he asked me to do or he, he, or he altered in my mind to do. Okay, because that's the trick of the enemy. All right. So obviously continue to read the rest of that um, on your own. But I just wanted to kind of throw that out there just to show, obviously, the spirit of error. And then um, I'll read from the first book of Adam and Eve, chapter six. We read this before. Um, obviously, look into this book as well. Be careful. Make sure you connect it. I wouldn't suggest that you just outright read this if you have no understanding of the of, you know, Torah and just, you know, just overall wisdom of, of, of different connections of scriptures. Um, nothing wrong with you being patient to read this at a later time. Um, but it has some things that, you know, that we obviously use as scripture that connects with other scriptures. So chapter six, verse three. He therefore sent his word to them. We know it's the son that they should stand and be raised immediately. And the son of the most high said to Adam and Eve, you transgressed of your own free will until you came out of the garden in which I had placed you. Of your own free will, you have transgressed through your desire for divinity, greatness and an, ex and an exalted state and an exalted state such as I have. So that I deprived you of the bright nature in which you then were, and I made you come out of the garden to this land, rough and full of trouble. If only you had not transgressed my commandment and kept my law or kept my Torah or kept my wisdom and had not eaten of the fruit of the tree, which I told you not to come near. And there were fruit trees in the garden better than that one. So you read other scriptures on that and you notice that there's a, a tree of, of, of life. Um, tree of life. I think there's a tree of righteousness. Um, so you check that on, out on your own, which is awesome to kind of see. It's like, why? You know, it's just, it's just unfortunate that the, the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil, thinking that that was going to raise their estate when <laughs> the Most High was trying to show them something different. Uh, first Adam and Eve, yeah, chapter six, verse seven. So it says, but the wicked Satan or Matsima did not keep his faith and had no good intents towards me that although I had created him, he considered me to be useless and sought the Godhead for himself. So Godhead, that's another insert, I would say, for Trinity doctrine, because that's what they also call it. Um, you could say you can use the word Godhead in a different manner that doesn't have to connect to the Trinity doctrine, which basically in its basic terms state that the son is the father 
the Father is the Son, and the Son is the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit is the Father. So they try to connect it, being all, quote unquote, one being in distinct roles, when that's not actually the case. We know that the Son was begotten of the Father. He was created. That's why he's the Alpha and the Omega. But the Son is the Son. He sits on the right hand of the Father. If the Father was the Son, then he would be literally sitting next to himself. But that's not how we utilize the scriptures of understanding. We know that the Son is the full image of the Father. Therefore, his full image is sitting right next to him. But he is still the Messiah, the Son, in whom he created all things through his Son, in whom the Son, when he returns, will put everything under his feet because everything is his that the Father has given to him and created is all the sons. So eventually, when the son comes back, he puts all things under his feet. Um, there will be a, a millennial reign, which thousand year reign, where he's king on earth, the son himself. And then when everything, um, and that's when Matsima, Satan himself, will be locked up for a thousand years. And um, after that thousand years, he's going to be released for a short time. And he's going to actually cause a spirit of error to go on all these different people, multitudes of people, then there's going to be a f final judgment. And then that's when everything is cleaned up yet again from that threshing floor that he's separated the wheats and the tares one last time. And then we'll be fully ready to be in the father's presence in the new Jerusalem, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. So, um, yeah, so let me go back to verse seven. So for this, I hurled him down from heaven so that he could not remain in his first estate. So Satan, Massima, is not in his first estate. He has been brought down. It was he who made the tree pleasant in your eyes. These are keys. Massima makes things look like there's something. The uh, tree appear pleasant in your eyes until you ate of it by believing him his words, his instructions. Thus have you transgressed my commandment and therefore I have brought on you all these sorrows because that is the justified, that's the justified punishment. For I am Abba, the creator, or if also even if this is the son who was speaking, he also is a creator as well. So some people only place uh, the verb, the verb haya, to the father, which you can, you know, you can use a verb to personify uh, a name um, or a title to the father and the son. That's why we use different names, right? Because they have different meanings within the verbs and, the, and you know, the, the parts of speech. Um, so within the word haya, which means to create or exist, um, etc., cetera, uh, that word is also tied to the son. To the to the Messiah, so it's not just specifically saying Haya, the verb is the Father, but ultimately I typically start using um, like a noun first and then a verb. So that's why I say Messiah, Yasha. Um, so that's why I also say Abba, Haya, right? So he's the Father of creation, but also the Messiah. If I wanted to say Messiah Haya, the Messiah has also created through the father, because that's what the father granted him to do, um, allowed him to do. So um, Yashahaya or <laughs> Messiah Yasha or Emmanuel, um, who create who created also um, the world and the things within it. It says, verse nine, when I created my creatures, did not intend I did not intend to destroy them. But after they had sorely roused my anger, I punished them with grievous plagues until they repent. So we talked about that, right? The sin of commission and omission. There's a cycle when repentance, turning away, but even in Hebraic understanding, we talked about that, that you're changing a whole different course of action while your heart and your mind are also um, in a sorrowful state of knowing that you transgress the, uh, the instruction. But the whole intention behind it is not to keep returning back to the ways of sin. And we're actually going to hit on that today um, a little bit more after we kind of build this framework up. Um, and then verse 10. But if on the contrary, they still harden, they continue, they still continue hardened in their transgression. They shall be under a curse for 
forever. A curse forever. Okay. Um, and then you notice when Moses, right? Moses says, I set before you verse uh, uh, Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 19. I call heaven and earth to record this day against you that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Life is connected to blessing. Death is connected to cursing. He says, therefore, choose life that both thou, you or you and your seed may live right unto the father that you may live in wisdom. Uh, yeah, so that's another connection there. All right. So that's where you see a nice little um, connection there with spirit of error. You see this little framework of understanding where the spirit of error has come from, where it's where it's going or where it is. And so just keep this in mind for today's study. If you guys have any questions, obviously, within it, uh, you guys know you can always put it in the comments or anything like that. I'll try to get to it if I can. If it's not, um, you know, I, once I'm making sure the flow is is good and it's flowing. So we're going to be looking into King Saul. This is First Samuel through Second Kings are my like top books like ever since I was a kid. Um, they also call first Samuel and second Samuel first Kings and second Kings and other translations and the old ones. And then therefore first Kings and second Kings in the regular Canon Protestant Canon would be third Kings and fourth Kings. But either way, first Samuel, second Samuel, like that titled that way too, because you actually see more of the prophet Samuel in there and you know that there was a prophet or actually he was a seer, which is a different type of prophet, um, is in those chapters, right? So awesome books. But this is the cool thing about what we're going to study about knowing our enemy. We're going to look at Saul and we're going to see his transformation from a man of the most high to a man of the enemy. <laughs> and we're going to build an understanding on how demonic attacks and demonic possessions, how there's levels to it. And there's obviously a clear difference, but then also for us to be able to understand based off of how we're living our life, if we're not living it in wisdom, or we're not walking in the path of the Torah of his instructions. Um, instead of us just saying, oh, keep the commandments, keep the commandments. We're doing it in the right heart, right? And through the spirit, but doing it in the right heart, right mindset, um, in the right, um, uh, you know, body, not through our flesh of sin, um, obeying sin, but we're going to be able to understand why and how we actually see our enemy coming against us even more and the different sources of it. Okay. So yeah, so I think this will be a little fun one. So if you, if you have first Samuel, um, I think second Samuel might even come up, but go ahead and turn to that one. And uh, let's see here. Should I take my restroom break right now? Yeah, I know I always have a bathroom break because I, I was drink so much. I'm drinking so much water during these studies and coffee and stuff like that. Let's see. Because once I get started, you don't want to break this. So I think I'm going to go ahead. Yep, I'm going to go ahead because it's two minutes to an hour. Don't even feel like an hour. Maybe it does for you. <laughs> so I'm going to go ahead and use these two minutes. Uh, let me let me let me go do a little bathroom break real quick. Make sure you have first Samuel. Grab your snacks, your study materials, your notes and all that cool stuff. I'll be right back. Give me one second.
back yet again. What type of snacks you guys get during these studies? <laughs> All right, y'all. So, First Samuel. I want to pull this up real quick. My little notes here. Got it. All right. So, as I always, say if you need, you want to take a screenshot. Um, if you need the actual um, image, you can always message me uh, for it. So I will, I'm always open to sending, talking about it, whatever you need. All right, so go to First Samuel chapter nine. And so we're gonna use these, these notes as a way to navigate through, okay? So what we're trying to be aware of is <laughs> pineapple fruit drink, cucumber, ginger water. Okay, y'all, uh, a little healthy. Okay. <laughs> um, we're gonna use this as a uh, as notes to be able to go through. But you're you're trying to be aware of the spirit of error, of course, and we're we're trying to understand more about our enemy. We're trying to understand. We're we're catching different things. To be, able to be able to know more about our enemy and at the end of this study the goal will be the goal should be or the the what we should have accomplished is gain a lot more insight into what we see in our every day and what we're seeing in our times especially in a spiritual matter because it's not it's obviously going to manifest in the physical but we got to make sure we understand spiritually what's going on um, it's easier when you're just reading it and you're just knowing, OK, I'm just using these type of scriptures, but it's more of a discernment, more of a an awareness. If it's saying that we need to be watchful through, you know, accomplishing the commandments, uh, the living the right way, living in righteousness and fear and wisdom. We also are watching to understand what's going on, not just in the world, but in our everyday life, literally in our homes and the people we interact with. Every single thing that you're doing, your thoughts in your heart, everything. Okay, so let's go ahead. First Samuel chapter nine. Surprisingly, very good. <laughs> the pinky out drinking. <laughs> All right. Um, I'm messing with you. All right. <laughs> All right. So chapter nine. Uh, let's see here. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to skip through. Okay. So read verse one. There is a Benjamite, a man of standing, whose name was Kish, son of Ebio, son of Zeror, the son of Becherath, the son of Aphia of Benjamin. Kish had a son named Saul, and he was a handsome young man as could be found anywhere in Israel, and he was a head taller than anyone else. So it's kind of interesting uh, to kind of get that other Saul connection, right? Paul Saul. Uh, Paul supposedly was a Benjamite, too. So it's kind of interesting to see the king saw was a Benjamite. Very interesting. Um, so I put verse 27, word of the most high made known. So um, in this chapter, you see what's going on. And Saul is chosen to be king. And um, he hasn't been anointed just yet until you go down to verse. Let's see here. Let's go to verse. 25 okay verse 25 okay and this is also a result of israel asking for a king by the way so the most high shoes is their king their first king um and, and after their request specifically verse 25 after they came down from the high place to the town samuel uh, talked with Saul on the roof of his house. Uh, notice an exalted state, right? He's being exalted right now. They rose about daybreak and Samuel called to Saul on the roof. Get ready and I will send you on your way. When Saul got ready, he and Samuel went outside together. As they were going down, so now, I'm sorry. So they go down to the edge of the town. Samuel said to Saul, 
tell the servant to go on ahead of us. And the servant did so. Uh, but you stay here for a while so that I may give you a message from the most high. OK, so um, let's see here. Wait, was this the. Hmm. There may have been a a, a mix up here that I might have wrote wrong. Give me one second. Let me make sure it's the next chapter. So chapter 10. Yeah, so I must I, I put the wrong one. So it's not David anointed in chapter 10 uh, in, verse, in this second one right there. It's Saul anointed. Notice I did that one wrong. Sheesh. All right. So we'll go to verse 27, obviously, um, in here. And we'll read, we'll read verse one, actually. Give me one second, y'all. Making sure I'm not mixed up in this. I feel like I, I probably did wrote it wrong. All right, all right. Give me one second. Okay. All right. So chapter 10 here. All right. So chapter 10. So verse one. So you see, then Samuel took a flask of olive oil and poured it on Saul's head and kissed him, saying, has not the most high anointed you ruler over over his inheritance. So you remember, remember the fruits of wisdom. Uh, study that we talked about a little bit of the olive oil. Um, and this here is one of the ways used to quote unquote purify and also um, establish within obviously Saul's ordained path. And um, you also will see that it says, um, let's see here in verse three, it says, then you will go on from there until you reach the great tree of Tabor. Three men going up to worship the most high at Bethel will meet you there. One will be carrying three young goats, another three loaves of bread and another a skin of wine. They will greet you and offer you two loaves of bread, which you will accept from them. So some more symbolism, just a note um, from the fruits of wisdom, because that's really going to be a lot of the uh, connections also from that study, interestingly enough. And then it says in verse six, it says the spirit of the most high will come powerfully upon you and you will prophesy with them and you will be changed into a different person. Once these signs are fulfilled, do whatever your hands find to do for the most high is with you. So you notice right here, right? It says the spirit of the most high changed him into a different person. OK, to a different person. So we're looking at his journey and we're ultimately finding out spiritually what what's going on, because we can also reflect on our own journey. And it says once these signs, right, when the spirit was in him, these signs are fulfilled when it's in him, do whatever his hand, his works, whatever the Ruach guides him to do in his life, in his ordained path, whatever he finds to do in righteousness, go do it because the most high is with you. All right. Uh, verse nine, as Saul turned to leave Samuel, uh, the most high changed Saul's heart and all these signs were fulfilled that day. Right. Creating me a clean heart. Right. And renewing me a right spirit. All right. And that is. That is a shout out to. Psalm. 51, 10. All right. Let's go back. Okay, so make sure you're following this whole journey. Uh, verse 10. When he and his servant arrived at Gibeah, a procession of prophets met him, and the spirit of the Ruach, or the Ruach of the Father, came powerfully upon him, and he joined in their prophesying. When all those who have formerly known him saw him prophesying with the prophets, they asked each other, What is this that the ha that has happened to the son of Kish is Saul also among the prophets. Okay. And um, yes, 
So let's see here. I'm gonna go down, 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 down. Make sure we don't have anything else to read on chapter 10. Okay, so verse 25, you see Samuel explain to the people the rights and duties of kingship. So there's instructions given, right? He wrote them down on a scroll and deposited it before the father. Then Samuel dismissed the people to go into their own homes. Okay. So let's go to, are we reading anything from chapter 11? Make sure we're not. Okay. So now we're going to go to verse, uh, chapter two, I'm sorry. It's first Samuel chapter 12. Okay. So where we are right now, we see Saul is anointed. He's has a spirit of the most high. He's been changed into a whole different person. His heart is cleansed, right? His walk is now, he's now put on the straight path. Okay, so remember what we talked about. Sins of commission of omission, you receive instructions first, right? There's repentance at the end of what happens with commission or omission, but it's not supposed to go in a constant, constant cycle. We do go through that cycle. However, when we're trying to get to the right place, especially that's where we're supposed to not allow that cycle to continue to um, rise in our life. So what the enemy wants, knowing our enemy, the enemy wants to keep that cycle going. But will repentance always be at the end of the cycle? We're going to find out. Um, That's kind of like a cool law. Stay tuned. We'll find out. Foreshadow. I don't know. Anyway. <laughs> Chapter 12, we're going to read Samuel's last words to Israel. Okay. So we're going to I think we're going to read this whole chapter. So it says, Samuel said to Israel, I am reading from the NIV. Let me read from, I'll just go ESV. Why not? And Samuel said to all Israel, behold, I have obeyed your voice and all that you have said to me and you have made a king over you. And now behold, the king walks before you. I am old and gray and behold, my sons are with you. Side note, this is a time when Samuel was actually technically over Israel before they requested a specific king. Samuel is a type of seer. I'm mean, a type of prophet whom is actually uh, he was called a seer and he has direct connection literal like speaking directly to the most high uh seeing things in the spirit realm just as we talked about in the first study with balaam uh when, it, when he had the spirit of divination so this is technically um another type of seer or a specifically a seer uh he was over israel and they requested a king so that's why he's saying that uh i have walked before you from my youth until this day verse three here I am, testify against me before the Most High, before his anointed. Whose ox, whose ox have I taken? Whose donkey have I taken? Whom have I defrauded? Um, wh whom have I oppressed? Or from whose hand have I taken a bribe to blind my eyes with? Testify against me and I will restore it to you. They said, you have not defrauded us or oppressed us or taken anything from any man's hand. And he said to them, the Most High is witness against you and his anointed is with the witness this day. That you have not found anything in my hand. They said he is witness. So that's awesome. Imagine you get to, before you pass to confirm, <laughs> making your election sure, right? Um, verse six. And Samuel said to the people, the most highest witness who appointed Moses and Aaron and brought your fathers up out of the land of Egypt. Now, therefore, stand still that I may plead with you before the most high concerning all the righteous deeds of the father. Or the, and the son when he, that he performed for you and for your fathers. When Jacob went into Egypt and the Egyptians oppressed them, then your fathers cried out to the father um, and the son sent Moses, I'm sorry, and the father sent Moses and Aaron who brought your fathers out of Egypt and made them dwell in this place. But they forget the father, their Elohim, and he sold them into the hand of Sesera, commander of the army of Hazar, and into the hand of the Philistines and into the hand of the king of Moab. And they fought against him and they cried out to the Most High and said, We have sinned because we have forsaken the Most High and have served the Baals and the Astaroth. But now deliver us out of the hand of the enemies that we may serve you. There's repentance there. 
And the Most High sent Jeroboam and Barak. You can read about this also in Judges. And Jephthah and Samuel delivered you out of the hand of the enemies on every side, and you lived in safety. And when you saw that Nahash, the kingdom of Amorites, came against you, you said to me, No, but a king shall reign over us when the Most High was your king. Crazy. Crazy. You, they asked for a king because they saw tribulation and they had already had the Most High as their king. Man. Verse 14. Uh, I'm sorry, verse 13. And now behold, the king whom you have chosen for whom you have asked, the, behold, the father has set a king over you. If you will fear the most high and serve him and obey his voice and do not rebel against the commandment of the father. And if you both, if both you and the king who reigns, who reigns over you will follow the most high, it will be well. But if you will not obey the voice of the Most High, but rebel against the commandment of the Most High, then the hand of the Most High will be against you and your king and your king, whom you want as leader. Now, therefore, stand still and see this great thing that the Most High will do before your eyes. Is it not wheat harvest today? I will call upon the Most High that he may send thunder and rain and that you shall know that your wickedness is great, which you have done in the sight of the Most High in asking for yourselves a king. This is kind of interesting because you kind of find this also in this community or just in general with religion, right? People want a king over them uh, when the Ruach should be their king. Like the father is already your king. So making someone uh, your king over your understanding and over your walk, very dangerous. And as you see here is a sin, it's wickedness. Um, in all manners, everybody has a gift, but even as I've said before with teaching, right? The spirit of teaching or the gift of teaching, um, uh, I am a servant. I am below everyone and that is okay because I, I, that's what I love. I love what I, what I'm able to do through the most high and in great meekness, I try to go about this like this every single time, right? So Ultimately, it is a sin when you make someone a king over your understanding because we are under. We are the servants. We are the lowest. And that's why we also get judged more harshly. Right. So to continue, it says, so Samuel called upon the most high and the most high sent thunder and rain that day. And all the people greatly feared the father and Samuel. Um, it says, verse 19, almost done with this chapter. All the people said to Samuel, pray for your servants to the most high that we may not die. For we have added to all of our sins this evil to ask ourselves a king. And Samuel said to people, do not be afraid. You have done all this evil. Yet do not turn aside from following the most high, but serve the most high with all your heart. And do not turn aside after empty things that cannot profit or deliver, for they are empty for the for the father will not forsake his people for his great name's sake, because it has pleased the father to make you a people for himself. Moreover, as for me, far be it from you that I should sin against the father by ceasing to pray for you. And I will instruct you in the good and the right way. Only fear him and serve him faithfully with all your heart. There's again another pattern of the heart for consider what great things he has done for you. But. If you still do wickedly, you shall be swept away, both you and your king, both you and your king. OK, so we're still following this story, this development of Saul. OK, so you see there are instructions given. We see how Saul is anointed. He is given this leadership position, though he is still a servant, though he is still um He's been placed in a certain position to do things for Israel, but also he has instructions for himself. Um, it's a good note to make. Uh, we read in the Fruits of Wisdom that chapter, I believe it's chapter six. That chapter six is in the Wisdom of Solomon is actually written specifically to princes and to kings. So imagine like, let's just say governors and everybody, you know, in different countries and leadership positions 
um, you know, were to follow in the understanding where it says later on about discipline, right? About loving wisdom, about loving, um, loving the uh, the discipline that comes with it, and then eventually, quote, uh, in in one of the verses, how it shows like a pathway that um, following in his instructions gets you close or get, gets you to immortality in the most high, right? Because we understand that um, seek ye first the kingdom of the most high and all things will be added unto you. So those, it was actually written to princes because Solomon himself in his writing, he's actually a king, right? Um, but we still obviously use that for ourselves as well because um, there's great wisdom in that. So let me go back. So yes, so now, Let's continue. Um, verse four. Verse four. I mean, I'm, <laughs> first, first Samuel chapter 13. And I'm going to bounce around, of course. Um, let's see here. Okay, so a little bit of context just for verse one. Saul lived for one year and then became king. And when he had reigned for two years over Israel. Okay, so it's two years in. Now we're going to go to verse seven. Yeah, imagine. <laughs> Just imagine. I mean, that's the cool thing about the thousand year reign as well. We will be able to see that. That's a beautiful part. Just because he will be fully king. The Messiah will be fully king. And his priests will be have rulership. That's gonna be amazing. So that's a that's a very good good uh good uh statement there. So verse seven. And some Hebrews crossed the forge of the Jordan to the land of Gad and Gilead. Saul was still at Gilgal, and all the people followed him trembling. He waited seven days, the time appointed by Samuel, but Samuel did not come to Gilgal and the people were scattering from him. So pay attention to this. Uh, scattering from him. Verse nine. So Saul said, bring the burnt offering here to me and the peace offerings. So you watch that. You see how he's changing a little bit of his ways. OK. Um. Changing a little bit of his ways, y'all. So remember, he's anointed in the beginning. He's fallen in the instructions. He's supposed to have a changed heart. Okay? His whole being is supposed to have changed. He has a Ruach. Okay? Um, uh, so he asked for the peace offerings and, and offered the burnt offering. Remember, he is not a priest, by the way. So that's why Samuel... I was trying to give him an appointed time. Verse 10. As soon as he had finished offering the burnt offering, behold, Samuel, uh, Samuel came. Um, and that and that's that's a generic statement, by the way, because you will see certain kings had off certain offerings like um, uh, David partook in certain things, etc. But he had also had uh, Nathan, the prophet with him. So you can obviously go. Please go look into that. So that was just a generic statement. Um, as soon as he had finished offering the burnt offering, verse 10, behold, Samuel came. Most high is very detailed and not by accident. And Saul went out to meet him and greet him. Samuel said, what have you done? And Saul said, when I saw the people were scattering from me and that you did not come within the days appointed that the Philistines had mustered at McMash, I said, now the Philistines will come against us at Gilgal. And I have not sought the favor of the most high. So I forced myself and offered the burnt offerings. So he's explaining that he did something he thought was wise. Right. Instead of the actual, doing something, the actual instruction actually tells us to do. He changed the instruction. In his own mind, in the spirit of error, like we talked about earlier, just to just to be able to note it that. Oh, I should do this. Right. So knowing our enemy enemy will sometimes speed you up or change certain things in your mindset to say, okay, well, yeah, I can do that outside of the instruction or whatever the case is. Spirit of error. Um, 
Verse 13. And Samuel said to Saul, you have done foolishly. You have not kept the command, the instruction, the wisdom of the most high with which he commanded you. For then the father would have established your kingdom over Israel forever. But now your kingdom shall not continue. The father has sought out a man after his own heart and the most high has commanded him to be prince over his people because you have not kept what the instructions that were given to you in the beginning. Okay, so what Saul did was that sin of commission or omission? Sin regardless. But just for a little bit more detail, was that commission or omission? You have 10 seconds to answer. <laughs> um, uh, let's see here. This would be sin of commission. Uh, <laughs> verse 15. And Samuel arose and went up from Gilgal. The rest of the people went up after Saul to meet the army. They went up from Gilgal to Gibeah of Benjamin. All right. Uh, let's see here. And Saul numbered the people who were present with him, about 600 men. Okay. So notice the 600 men. Um, when you go back up to verse 2, Saul actually chose 3,000 men. And 2,000 were with Saul and and 1,000 were with Jonathan. Okay. So now after he um, commits sin, right? Now he transgresses the, the, the commandment. He counts and he has 600 men with him because he's so, he's so engulfed on how many men are with him, how many followers, how many people are listening to him and he's guiding or whatever the case is, just to put it into present terms. So worried about how many people are following him. So he numbers it and sees there's only 600 now. Verse 16, and Saul and Jonathan, his son, and the people were present with them, stayed in Gibba of Benjamin and the Philistines in camp Michmash. Um, and we're going to go down to, yeah, we're, we're finished with this chapter, actually, because I don't have to read the rest of it. Okay. So we see something has changed now in Saul's walk. All right, so now let's go to chapter 14. Verse 24. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir, Watchman. Um, and the verse 24, chapter 14. And the men of Israel had been hard pressed that day. So Saul had laid out, laid an oath on the people saying, curse be the man who eats food until it's evening. And I am avenged on my enemies. So none of the people who had tasted food. Now, when all the people came to the forest, behold, there was honey on the ground. So this is a quick note. Um, he puts an oath on the people. This is a harsh oath. Okay. He says, you can't do this. You can't do that. Uh, make sure that you don't do this. But also because he's a king, he's in a leadership position, he puts a harsh oath on the people. Um, and there's scriptures. You go find more scriptures on why we shouldn't keep, uh, why you shouldn't have oaths specifically, especially unto the most high that you're specifically saying that in his power that he's given you. Um, not to... I'm just going to read one scripture because I, I thought I had it on here already. This, this, is, this is also just for your notes, by the way. Um, Matthew 5, 34. But I say to you, make no oath at all, neither by heaven, for it is the throne of the most high. Um, James 5, 12. But above all, my brethren, do not swear either by heaven or earth. Or with an uh, with any other oath by your uh, but your yes is to be your yes and your no, no, so that you may not fall under judgment, judgment. Okay. So he puts a harsh oath on the people. Okay. 
Um, let's see here. So we're going to. It's, uh, we shouldn't. We shouldn't. That's why I just look more into that about the oaths. It's a very powerful thing um, that is very warned against because there's different there's difference differences obviously in the oaths, but just make sure um, that's tied into you know different things that people say. There's there's blessing and cursing in the power of the tongue, right? So um, there's a difference between profanity specifically. Um, maybe I'll do a study on that one day. Sirach actually gives a very has a great chapter on profanity, but when it comes down to swearing within oaths and you know things of that nature, notice where it says, "Let your yes be your yes and no be no," so you don't come into judgment. There's more into that when it's talking about specifically saying an oath, right? If you if you sat there and said, "Oh, I will not sin," like talking to the Father. I won't sin anymore today. And you're saying this is the oath that I established between you and me, Abba. Like, <laughs> that, you know, easy, easy marker. That's that's most dangerous thing, because once you uh, fail that oath, probably in the next two seconds, who knows? Right. Um, it's over because it's like you're making a you're making a whole statement that you really should not do. So, you know, just just an example, just an example. Yeah, just just an example. So just just make a mark for it. Like I always tell you guys, look into it a lot more, and obviously hit me with anything that you uh, want to discuss. So continuing, uh, let's see here. So Jonathan ends up breaking this oath on accident, or right, he actually not even on accident. He just because he didn't hear, he didn't hear his father say that, as he finds some honey, okay, and he eats it. And it actually, like uh, verse 27, part B, it says he put his hand to his mouth and his eyes became bright. So there's some um, good connection there as you can find with honey. And then, you know, the word, obviously, remember, remember Ezekiel ate the scroll and it was like honey to his stomach. Uh, you know, John did the same thing and it was like bitter um, in, his, in his stomach, but it was uh, honey in his mouth. So it's a lot you can connect with there, too, if you never noticed it before. Um, let's see here. So we're going to go to verse 36. All right, so verse 36. Then Saul said, let us go down after the Philistines by night and plunder them into the morning light. Let us not leave a man of them. Uh, and they said, do whatever seems good to you. Nice. Very good, sister. Um, do whatever seems good to you. But the priest said, let us draw near to the most high here. And Saul inquired of the most high, shall I go down after the Philistines? Will you give them into the hand of Israel? Watch this. But the most high did not answer him that day. Very key. He did not answer him that day. And Saul said, come here, all you leaders of the people and know and see how this sin has arisen today. For the Most High lives who saves Israel. Though it be in Jonathan, my son, he shall surely die. But there is not a man among all the people who answered him. He said to all Israel, you shall be on one side and I and Jonathan, my side, uh, be on the other side. And do what, And the people said, do what seems good to you. Therefore, Saul said, O Abba of Israel, why have you not answered your servant this day? If this guilt is in me or in Jonathan, my son, uh, Abba of Israel, give Urim. But if this guilt is in your people, give Thummim. Um, you're going to look into Ur Urim and Thummim. It's a really cool uh, concept and um, portion of scripture um, that you should you should look into. It's, a, it's an old saying that they used to have. And Jonathan and Saul were taken, but the people escaped. And Saul said, cast a lot between me and my son, Jonathan. Also lots. You can look into that as well. Um, it's kind of like you can imagine like a dice roll. Right. So remember, the most high is with Saul. OK. He. He dis, he transgresses the commandment, the instructions of the most high and goes into his own wisdom. Right. Within the spirit of error that we talked about earlier, saw how that had to do with Hasatan or Satan or Matsima and then obviously Adam and Eve. Right. 
uh, we saw what happens with, with them within the spirit of error. So then you come into here, you see Saul has the same spirit of error that he transgresses the commandment, his own wisdom, which the enemy is obviously behind it all um, to, you know, give him that push and that temptation to do what he did. Therefore, he committed his sin of commission. He actually did not. He did something that he wasn't supposed to do, um, though he received the instruction. And Samuel gives him that judgment, especially because he's a king. He's like, there's no repentance for your king kingdom because now it has taken away. It's been taken away from me because the most high has chosen a person of who's after his heart. Who's after his instructions. Right. So then we get here and Saul. Who is on the wrong side of the father, basically, where he's not receiving instruction. He literally he's not being answered. So. Yet again, he goes into his own wisdom to say, OK, well, I'll just cast them lots and I'm praying to the most high. He doesn't even wait. No patience. Right. If you're not hearing from the most high, that's red flag. It's like buckle down. You know, remember, remember how in the scriptures they would put um, uh, ash. Right. They would ash and sackcloth on their head and they would repent. There was not even no ash, ash and sackcloth for Saul right now. He just continues <laughs> um, and he casts a lot. So Jonathan is taken and. Yeah. So, like I said, we're not reading into full story of it. Um, later on, Israel actually says, speaks up and says Jonathan shouldn't die because there was great salvation that came from Jonathan. And so they actually speak up. So they avoid the sin of omission by not just remember they said, oh, do whatever you got to do. But then they're like, no, that's not right. That's not the upright thing to do. Don't kill your son because that's not right. So now they avoid the sin of omission and they speak up. They did something that they know they should have and they actually did it. All right. So now my next slide here or continuing. Hope you guys are enjoying this so far. Uh, let's see here. OK. The Most High rejects Saul. OK. So we're in chapter 15 now following this journey. So chapter 15. And that's going to be, I know it's kind of cut off there. This is chapter 15 and it's one through three first. Okay. We're going to break, break some things down. So note, this is still a part of knowing our enemy. Verse one. And Samuel said to Saul, the father, the most high has sent me to anoint you over king, over his people, Israel. Now, therefore, listen to the words of the father. Thus says Abba of hosts, I have noted what Amalek did to Israel in opposing them on the way when they came up out of Egypt. Now go and strike Amalek and devote to destruction all that they have. Do not spare them, but kill both man and woman, child and infant, ox and sheep, camel and donkey. So he's given the instruction. OK, he's given the instruction on what to do in this specific war. All right. So now verse eight. Um, so after Saul defeats them, verse eight, he took Agag, the king of Amalek, Amalekites alive and devoted to destruction all the people with the edge of the sword. But Saul and the people spared Agag and the best of the sheep and of the oxen and of the fattened calves and the lambs and all that was good and would not utterly destroy them. All that was despised and worthless, they devoted to destruction. So now in their own actions and their own wisdom, they decide not to do exactly what the father said to do. Exactly what the instruction was to do. So they consciously made a choice. Through the spirit of error that I'm going to error and choose against the, the most high. Literally, it's just got an instruction. Do this. Boom. Right. Um, 
it's crazy. So there's something I did note. I don't want to go into it too heavy, but um, things that the Most High put under the ban. That's a very overlooked concept. Um, and I, or, you know, I say concept, but it's a very overlooked um, instance in the scriptures where in, the, uh, in, the, in the, the heat of the war or at the end of the war of a battle that Israel would win, the Most High would put things that of, were, were of the enemy, even if it had, you know, quote unquote, a symbol, um, a symbol that let's just say is evil or something of that nature. Let's just say whatever was of the enemy, if the Most High said this specific portion of it is mine, like it's like it's almost like a first fruits type of thing from the uh, from the spoils of the enemy or spoils of war. He would put things of the enemy under the ban and Israel was not to touch it because it wasn't theirs. So in Joshua 6, 18, you'll see uh, the father in the sense, same instance of him telling Adam and Eve not to eat of the fruit of the tree of knowledge of evil to stay away from it. Um, he's given that commandment. He tells the Israelites not also to touch anything that is mine that I put underneath under under the ban. And therefore, don't even look at it. Don't even allow your lust to want of the first things, like the great things. Because by our perception and by how the enemy changes things, like we saw in the in the first Adam and Eve in chapter 6, the enemy changed that tree, a fruit of knowledge of, of good and evil, to look better than all the other trees when that wasn't even the case, because all the other ones actually look better than that one. But because of what he planted in the spirit of error and what he planted into the mind of Eve, and then obviously Eve to, uh, to Adam, it looked different. It, it was the perception and the mindset was different because essentially they also changed their being. They started changing their mindset from where it was following his instruction to a whole different mindset of, now I'm going to transgress um, within the spirit of error. So when we get back to Saul and seeing what he did, he takes of the first fruits. He takes of the things that were going to be put under under the ban. He takes that from the most high. He does not literally do exactly what the most high tells him to do. Which is, I mean, how bold can you be? But he's in the spirit of error. OK, we're going to see more of how deep the spirit of error actually gets. So now now we get we, 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 we find a, we're getting into a, a, a deeper flow now. OK. Y'all already know how we how we do this get into a deeper flow. Um, let's see here. Eight through nine. So verse 10, so it says, the most high came to Samuel. I regret that I have made Saul king. Uh, look into the word regret, by the way, but it's going to tell you something about regret uh, later. For he has he has turned back from following me. And he has not performed my Torah, my instructions, my commandments. And Samuel was angry. He cried to the most high all night. Um, and verse 13, it says, Samuel came to Saul and Saul said to him, blessed be to you. Uh, in the Most High, I have performed the commandment of the Most High. How? How? What was that famous meme Kanye thing? How, sweet? Uh, how? How did he perform it? Uh, he's in error. He's in delusion now. Verse 14, Samuel said, What then is the bleeding of the sheep into my ears and the lowing of the oxen that I hear? Um... And then Saul tries to say in verse 15 what he did. And verse 16, Samuel says to Saul, stop. I will tell you what the Most High said to me this night. And he said to him, speak. Okay, so like I said, delusion is coming from the spirit of error. Okay, very key. Samuel said, though you are little in your own eyes, are you not the head of the tribes of Israel? The Most High anointed you king over Israel and the Most High sent you on a mission and said, go devote to destruction the sinners. 
the Amalekites and fight against them until they are consumed. Why then do you, did you not obey the voice of the Most High? Why did you pounce on the spoil and do what was evil in the sight of the Most High? Saul said to Samuel, I have obeyed the voice of the Father. I have gone on the mission on which the Most High sent me. You're lying. Did we not see? I'll show that screenshot after we're finished about that little chart that we have. Within the spirit of error, there's a spirit of lying as well. There's there's lying, there's envy, there, there's a lot of things within it. So you start seeing more spiritual warfare in the sense of the spirits that are coming, the demons that are coming behind when someone has transgressed the commandment. That's why we talk about the sins. Because the sins have everything to do with a person constantly being in error, though they may think they're not in error. And there's delusion, there's blindness. That's what we had it on that on that on that um on that chart. There's blindness that comes with it. There's constant development of spirit spirits that are coming against that person. Um, whether it's in attack or possession, which we'll cover in a little bit. Um, let's continue. Verse 22. And Samuel said, has the father as great, has the father great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the most high? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to listen than the fat of rams for rebellion is as the sin of divination. Rebellion is as the sin of divination. And presumption is as iniquity and, and idolatry. So I'm going to look up presumption just to get us a a, a, a clean little defi uh, definition of it. Presumption is an idea that is taken to be true and often used as a basis for other ideas, although it is not known for certain. In the matter of law, it's an attitude adopted in law or as a matter of policy toward an action or proposal in the absence of acceptable reasons to the contrary. So um, essentially that's saying for our understanding within the commandments, it's a false idea or an idea that's taken to be true or something that's flipped and changed, an error taken to be as true towards an action that is actually uh, literally uh, just because there's scripture connections to fit the framework of whatever may not be true doesn't mean that there should be an absence of actually what is truth of what actually the Torah or the instructions or whatever that topic may be, it should actually be there, right? Because there shouldn't be absence. It shouldn't be absent of it. So therefore, when we go back, it says rebellion is as a sin of divination and presumption is as iniquity and idolatry because iniquity is a transgression of the law. It's, it's, it's the evil that comes from making something true that is false, right? And idolatry in itself creates something in your heart and your mind to worship something, to hold something at a high esteem that should not be accepted. That is actually not supposed to be on the same level as what is true. There's a lot into that. Um, but let's continue. Because you have rejected the actual instructions of the Most High, the word of the Most High, verse 23b, he has also rejected you from being king. He's rejected your ordained path that he put your your title, your 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 purpose. He has rejected you from being king, as it says here. Um, well, how far am I? Okay. Saul said to Samuel, I have sinned, for I have transgressed the commandment of the Most High in your word. So now all of a sudden he's like, Oh, I sinned. After he was trying to liar he's trying to protect and cover up his error because i feared the most high and obeyed their voice so now he's revealing i, I feared i'm sorry i feared the people and i obeyed their voice and so just like adam in his error he blames eve <laughs> have a uh eve or have a however you want to say it 
uh, you see Saul is essentially doing the same thing, right? So that's why we're looking at this. Verse 25, now, therefore, please pardon my sin and return with me that I may bow before you, before the Most High. And Samuel said to Saul, I will not return with you, for you have rejected the Most High, and the Most High has rejected you from being king over Israel. As Samuel turned to go away, Saul seized the skirt of his robe and it tore. And Samuel said to him, so cold, I love it. Uh, the Most High has torn the kingdom of Israel from you this day and has given it to a neighbor of yours who is better than you. <laughs> it was, uh, that was, that was kind of cold. You kind of imagine that turn around. Uh, verse 29. And also the glory of Israel will not lie or have regret for he is not a man that he should have regret. Verse three. So that's where that regret connection is. Um, you can also find that obviously with, uh, Noah, when the Most High is talking to Noah about how he's regret making man, you know, you can find so much more in that, but he's not regretting as a man would regret. Okay. It's just a word that we have to use because we're finite beings and try to try to try to put this, these thoughts into a word that's just it's just so much more. Um, Verse 30, then he said, I have sinned, yet honor me now before the elders of my people, before Israel, return with me that I may bow before the Most High. So Samuel turned back after Saul, and Saul bowed before the Most High. Okay. Um, so we see here in the notes, ordained path not taken in the highest esteem. He didn't follow the instruction. Saul blames the people for his sin. Um, and then verse 22, when it talks about the, uh, this is very key, we've read this before. If you've been a part of the studies or, you know, read it yourself, um, verse 22, it says, has, does the most high delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices more than he does with your obedience of his instructions? Um, behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to listen than the fat of the rams, right? So Sirach Ecclesiasticus or Sirach 35 has a perfect connection to this when it talks about keeping the law, but we'll see how, um, how it says here. So the one who keeps the Torah's instructions makes many offerings. So you can also say in this context of what we're connecting it with, the one who obeys his voice makes many offerings. One who heeds the commandments makes an offering of well-being. The one who returns a kindness offers choice flower and the one who gives him alms sacrifices a thank offering to keep from wickedness is pleasing to the most high and to forsake unrighteousness is an, at an atonement. Do not appear before the most high empty handed for all that you offer is in fulfillment of the commandment. The offering um, offering of the righteous enriches the altar. It is pleasing odor it, and its pleasing odor arises before the most high. The sacrifice of the righteous is acceptable. Let's just say obedience and it will never be forgotten. Be generous when you worship the father and do not skimp the first fruits of your hands. Notice there's the fruits of wisdom already being seen in here. With every gift, show a cheerful face and dedicate your tithe with gladness. Give to the most high as he has given to you and as generously as you can afford for the most high is the one who repays and he will repay you sevenfold. So it's, it's so many connections. What, we, what we've been, um, what we've been talking about recently. Uh, and then it continues. I have to read it really quick because now it's showing, it's showing Saul's portion, right? The opposite of what is righteous. So it's saying in verse 14 of Sirach 35, do not offer him a bribe for he would not accept it and do not rely on a dishonest sacrifice for the most high is the judge and with him there is no partiality. He will not show partiality to the poor, but he will listen to the prayer of the one who is wronged. He will not ignore the supplication of the orphan or the widow which she pours out her complaint. Uh, do not the tears of the widow run down her cheek as she cries out against the one who causes them to fall. Those whose service is pleasing to the Most High will be accepted and their prayers will reach to the clouds. The prayer of the humble pierces the clouds and it will not rest until it reaches its goal. 
it will not desist until the Most High responds. Notice that the Saul did not wait till the Most High responded. He did what he wanted to do, right? And does justice for the righteous and executes judgment. Um, yeah, so you guys read, obviously read the rest of that, but it's a super clear connection um, with that. And so when we go back to 1 Samuel, and so we're still understanding the enemy, okay, through all of this. 1 Samuel, verse 24 through 29, you notice he says, oh, I transgressed it, right? He's asking for forgiveness. And and Samuel's like, no, there's no, <laughs> there's no forgiveness in this. There's no, uh, your judgment is your judgment now. Um, I want to bring up Hebrews 6 because it's actually going to come up a few more times with this Hebrews 6 connection. Hebrews 6. Um, verse 4. For it is impossible to restore again to repentance those who have once been enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and have shared in the Ruach and have tasted the good word of the Most High and the powers of the age to come and then have fallen away since they are crucifying again the son of the father to their own harm and are holding him up to contempt. Ground that drinks up the rain falling on it repeatedly and that produces a crop useful to those for whom it is cultivated receives a blessing from the father. Okay, that's a purifying thing that we talked also talked about in the fruits of wisdom. But if it produces thorns and thistles, right? And remember we talked about the son saying the branches that are not of me, the father takes away. It says in here, Hebrews part B of verse eight, it is worthless and on the verge of being cursed. It's in is to be burned over. Okay, perfect connection, perfect connection. All right, and then obviously you see Romans 18 through uh, chapter one, 18 to 32. You see how the Most High gave them over to their lusts, over to a reprobate mind, to a mind that is opposite of following in wisdom. The enemy knows this. The enemy knows what happens when he beguiles people into the spirit of error. He knows what happens. But the people that are within the spirit of error also, when they get to a point where they're in delusion and they're in blindness, there's a heart issue, right? There's a whole war within that person and it starts leading past attacks to different forms of possession of how the enemy and the spirit of error is within their actions and to their works and to their mind, which we're actually going to start seeing how Saul starts developing. Remember, Most High didn't answer his prayers. Then it results to this, right? He does something else again against the instructions. And then, and then there's judgment that comes with it. With it. And so <laughs> there's just a whole, we just literally see the fall of Saul. We see, we see a whole portion, but his spirit, right? He, ha he doesn't have, his spirit anymore, which we're about to see. Okay. Chapter, uh, so let me get my next graphic. Okay. So is this the one? All right. So now we go to Chapter 16 of Samuel. So this one is subtitled, David is anointed as king. So in the first couple verses, um, in the first verse, the Most High tells Samuel, stop grieving over Saul. I've already rejected him. His judgment is already final. Um, and go take your oil, which I had you anoint him with, but take your oil of uh, purification, in a sense, and, you know, etc., um, and I'm going to send you to the next person I actually chose, who's a man after my own heart. And uh, we're going to go to verse seven. It says, 
But the Most High said to Samuel, do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature because I have rejected him. Doesn't matter how many, what your platform looks like. Doesn't matter what someone looks like, especially in these times, especially when people are seeing certain things. Doesn't matter, right? Because the Most High sees not as a man sees. He looks at the outward appearance. I mean, I'm sorry. The man looks on the outward appearance, but the Most High looks on the heart. So though people can still be king or have platforms, whatever the case is, and can still show, oh, yeah, I'm this person. Therefore, especially today's world, how social media boosts up people, it boosts up people, it shows people, oh, it gives validity to saying, OK, yeah, everything this person says is true. Or I like how this person puts out videos like you literally see even dancers or like just the most harmless videos you think is harmless. People are actually connected to the occult and actually like it's like a it's like an also an agenda to pull people into this realm of social media and things of that nature that comes with it. Uh, but as soon as they change up in the ways of the other of people, they start canceling them. So it's very interesting. But going back. Um, what Samuel thought who was going to be king wasn't it because the most high says, I look at your heart constantly. Okay. Um, wow. Okay. Uh, so he says here. Yeah. So that was verse seven. So let's go get some keys here. Jeremiah chapter 17. So we're going to see some things and then we're going to see some things that the enemy has flipped. Okay, so verse 9 through 10. Jeremiah 17. Sorry, y'all. Verse 9 through 10. The heart is devious above all else. It is perverse. Who can understand it? I, the most high, the son also test the mind and search the heart to give to all according to their ways, according to the fruit of their doings. So when you think within the spirit of error that someone may have that also um, the things that the enemy is giving the fruits of their doings of the evil that of the doings of the evil. He would reward that person, too, because they're already in error. So the error of the fruits that are produced as given to the person as an error, they think that because of the fruits of the rewards that they're getting. Oh, yeah, let me continue on what I'm doing. That only gets the person more embedded into the spirit of error because the enemy is keeping that person in a state of delusion. Right. And then obviously. The most high has everything to do with whatever the enemy does because he has to allow it. So if he's searching the mind, testing the mind and searching the heart, he's going to give a person in a spirit of error and whatever else spirit that's coming with it according to their ways and the fruits of their doings. Right. That's why you go back and you can read in Romans chapter one, 18 to 32. He gave them over to their lust. He gave them over to their idolatry. He gave them over to their doings because that was the ways that they chose. Here's your fruit. Here's what you get to eat. Here's what you get to continue into the path with. All right. So and the enemy knows that. that's what he wants. That's what the enemy wants. All right. So first Peter five, eight. Disciplines yourselves, keep alert like a roaring, roaring lion. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around looking for someone to devour constantly. Okay, and we also have a Job 1 7 connection. The Most High said to the accuser, to Satan, to Matsima, Where have you come from? And, the, and Matsima answered, The Most High, from going to and fro on the earth. And from walking up and down on it. So he's constant. And obviously, if he has control over other demons, they're doing the same thing. They're sent out in ones, twos, sevens, you know, uh, different areas to disrupt and destroy. 
right? It's an organized chaos. That's why you have the New World Order, NWO, right? Order out of chaos. Proverbs 28, 15. Like a roaring, roaring, goodness gracious, lion or a charging bear is a rook, wicked ruler over a poor people. Okay? So I connected that with John. So a wicked ruler, wicked ruler is like a roaring lion or a charging bear. So I connected that with John 16, 7 through 11. Okay? Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. And if I do not go away, the advocate, who is the Holy Spirit, will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will prove the world wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment. About sin, because they do not believe in me and his wisdom. About righteousness, because I'm going to the Father. And you will see me no longer about judgment, because the ruler of this world has been condemned. Okay, so if the enemy is a ruler, right, of this roar of this world, though he's been condemned and the, de the keys of death has been taken away from him, ultimately, though he's still in his status, he's still a roaring, roaring lion waiting to devour. He's wicked. Okay, um, let's go to Mark 4, verse 15. It says, these are the ones on the path where the word is sown. When they hear it, Satan immediately comes and takes away the word that is sown in them. So if he's roaring, roaring around like a lion waiting to devour, he knows when, this, when the word is going to be sown into you. So he's waiting to take it from you. That's what we see with Saul has happened up until this point. He's literally been, everything has been taken from him. Right. <laughs> Literally, everything has been taken from him. He started out in a one way, supposedly changed in a one way. But here comes the spirit of error. Right. And he's engulfed in it. So. Literally, it says Matsima immediately comes immediately, immediately, no time in between takes away the word that was sown in them. That's why I keep talking about the word needing to be sown into good soil, right? Not on a rocky path and thorns and thistles, right? The fruits of wisdom have to be sown in good soil in order for you to actually reap and, I mean, actually for you to produce good fruit that the Most High will reap from you, especially when he returns. He don't want no trash fruit, no weak fruit. And someone actually sent to me, uh, Sarah, actually, uh, she talked about nipping the buds and she was talking about how um, someone who was trained in, you know, planting and things like that was saying that even if fruits like start trying to produce quickly, you want to like nip those buds. And so that way, stronger and tastier and more ripe fruit will actually come from it. So it goes back to the point of the matter within the fruits of the wisdom um uh teaching that that we were learning learning uh in that fruits take time right so why would you want to have a let's just say a quick fruit be grown that the enemy can easily take away that's like literally like an easy snatch off the tree we talking about fruits that cannot be taken off of the tree right because it's sown in life it's you know so it's it's so much more than that um, so let's continue. James 4, 7. I would have never thought, I, like I told you, I love this, these books, 1 Samuel through 2 Kings, and you read something and you love it, and you read it again later on, it's like, my goodness, it just, it just develops. Uh, James 4, 7. Submit yourselves before the Most High, resist the enemy, and he will flee from you. Okay, so now we see a like some counter solutions, right? Second Corinthians chapter four, four through seven. In their case, the God of this world, 
so Matsima, right? Or Satan has blinded the enemies or has blinded the minds of the unbelievers, those who are not in his wisdom, to keep them from seeing clearly the light of the gospel, of the wisdom, of the glory of the Messiah, who is the image of the Father. For we do not proclaim ourselves, we proclaim the Son as um, as and this is I'll say Ishi because we're trying to get away from Lord. If you guys don't have need some more information on that, um, with the Ishi, Ishi is different. Uh, Bao is also another word for master. Um, it's not just the the false god, but um, in the scripture in Isaiah it does say that we're trying to get away from. We won't call the Son um, master. Right. In the sense of worshiping a false God whom these other people were sacrificing their children, following the instruction of worshiping a false God in the ways where it was dead. Their works were dead. Um, so we're, we're getting away from saying that specifically. And saying more so Ishi, my husband or the, 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 the bridegroom, um, the Messiah, the savior, who is we call friend because we have made. The word in our hearts connected to him, wisdom, is he's our friend. He's literally a friend, especially when you go read, I skipped over it with Jonathan and David, how their oath between each other, their friendship was so powerful. It was like deeper than blood, right? It was like deeper than blood. And that's really how we're supposed to be having the word attached to us. It's deeper than everything that can get deep into us, into our heart and everything um, into our and it's, it's literally into our very fiber. So that's why you'll see the word is quick. Right. It, 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 it penetrates even down to the marrow, to the joints in the marrow. Right. To the dividing asunder to the ligaments, everything that is it's, it's alive. It's what it's supposed to be within us. Um, man. And I think I was reading to see here. So verse five in second Corinthians chapter four, for we do not proclaim ourselves as your slaves for uh, Isaiah's sake, for it is the most high who said light will shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of the father in the face of the Messiah. All right, so let's go back to. First Samuel chapter 16. Now we're going to go to verse 13. So we're still following Sam, Saul's story. It says, verse 13, Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the Ruach rushed upon David from that day forward, rushed upon him in him. And Samuel rose and went to Ramah. So you notice the man after his own heart, after the Most High's heart, received the ruck immediately upon being anointed. So he's in the same sense, just like Saul, he was starting it. But the difference is the Most High shows which or how his actual ruck actually will stay with us, who is actually in the right heart. The ones who are not, that Baruch will not stay, even if you receive it initially. It's very interesting. Hebrews 6 is very, very looked over. And it's also, you'll go read it also on live, online. Though I should tell you, it's not true. That's not what it's saying. All that stuff. Okay. So, um, mm -mm -mm. okay. So now we're going to go to chapter 16. Yeah, we're already chapter 16, verse 14. Now, the rock of the most high departed from Saul. So it departs from Saul and a harmful spirit from the most high torments him. So the most high sends it from Matsima's, right? From Matsima's army, because that's what he's a, the most high. He got control over everything. He sends a demon to Saul to torment him because at that point, there is the, the, the Ruach of the Most High is gone from Saul. So now we see a total opposite than where we started from the beginning. This is what the enemy wants. 
And the most hall, um, for verse 15, and Saul's servant says to him, behold, now a harmful spirit from the father is tormenting you. Let our Lord, which is they're connecting it to Saul, command your servants who are before you to seek out a man who is skillful in playing the lyre. And when, uh, which is like, like a, you could say the harp. And when the harmful spirit of the most high is upon you, he will play it and you will be well. And so uh, Saul acts to bring that man. And then um, verse 23, it says, whenever the harmful spirit, the demon was upon Saul, David took the harp and played it with his hand, right? So his fruits, the fruits of David's hands were of the Ruach, of the spirit of the most high, who can only push away and destroy, obviously, the enemies, demons, and the enemy itself. So Saul was refreshed and was well, and the harmful spirit departed from him. So notice, if Saul does not have the Ruach, right? It's not saying that the, uh, the, the, the spirit left him, the spirit of error. It did not leave him fully because it just departed from him for the moment. It's a temporary pleasure. I don't really want to read into a lot of this, but you guys can uh, do more research on it. Leviticus 15, 16 through 18 talks about the emission of semen, which is unclean or even the act of sex itself was an unclean act. Um, but initially with the emission of semen, it was looked at obviously as unclean in that person uh, and whoever it touched or whatever, even items that it was touched uh, would be unclean until the evening. So, because um, initially, if you want to look at it as a temporary pleasure, um, that also connects to masturbation. And I've, I've actually spoke on this one um, before. And I think there's a lust teaching. I'm not sure. I have to look it up. But just look into it. Just keep it for yourself. Obviously, those are... Um, it's not saying that the relations between a man and a woman who are married is the same. Because we know that's uh, adultery, etc., fornication. Um, and masturbation also is a sin. So if it's already unclean, notice how... There's a spirit that is behind it because it's unclean. Something is unclean. Um, not every emission of semen is a, is a spirit behind that, by the way. So y'all make sure y'all divide that with discernment. Um, please do. Because when I'm coming back and be like, what did you say? Or trying to tell somebody this and that. Please divide it correctly. Okay. Uh, Sirach 18, 30 through 31 talks about temporary reliefs. Luke 11, 23 through 28. Okay. So there's a connection with that. All right. And then let's go to Sirach chapter 23. One through six. So now this is a flip, right? Of pushing against the actual spirit of error. Uh, sister was actually sending me some stuff about praying and things like that. Um, when, you know, when you're trying to, when you're within spiritual warfare, let's just say. Um, and we're going to go over that later on in a, in a different portion of the weapons. But notice this, what Sirach says in chapter 23. O Abba, master of my life, do not abandon me to their designs and do not let me fall among them. Who will set whips over my thoughts and discipline of wisdom over my mind so as not to spare me in my errors and not overlook my sins? Otherwise, my mistakes may be multiplied and my sins may abound and I may fall before my adversaries and my enemy may rejoice over me. O oh, Abba, the Elohim, Elohim of my life, do not give me haughty eyes and remove desire from me. Let neither gluttony nor lust overcome me and do not give me over to shameless passion. Okay. And it's interesting. There's talks about an oath in this chapter, in the rest of the chapter, verse seven through uh, 15. It talks about, you know, your tongue, this discipline of the tongue, not using profanity, things like that. Very interesting. Okay. And obviously, Sirach chapter 17. 
which I am not going to read. Um, let's see. I thought I was going to be able to take less than two hours today, but it's okay. Um, yeah, so please, please read Sirach chapter 17. Put that on your notes. Very good scripture to connect with that. All right. So let me skip the next screenshot here. This should be the last portion of looking at Saul. All right. So now we go Oh wait. Give me one second, y'all. Yeah, I think, yeah, I think we actually, did we actually get finished with this one? Oh, here it is. Sorry. So now we get into the spirit possesses Saul. Okay. Now we get to a whole different portion. We already see how bad it's getting. So chapter 18. First Samuel chapter 18. So we're going to read verse 7 through 12. And the woman sang to one another as they celebrated. Saul has struck down his thousands and David his ten thousands. And Saul was very angry. And this saying displeased him. And he said, they have ascribed to David ten thousands and to me. They have ascribed thousands. What more can he have but the kingdom? And Saul eyed David from that day on. What does that sound like? Envy. Right. Did we not see in that chart from the last study within this spirit of error? Now you have spirit of envy. You have spirit of lust. You have um, what you see here. You have angry uh, anger, spirit of anger. So now you see there's more spirits that come with it. And you, you now it's, it's it's to a possession portion where he's possessing his heart and his mind. Right. And it just keeps elevating, keeps elevating. Um, verse 10, the next day, a harmful spirit from the most high rushed him, rushed upon Saul and he raved within his house. So notice it's a different type of spirit, spirit of anger, spirit of violence, it's like a violent spirit from the most high rushed upon Saul and he raved within his house while David was playing the harp as he did day by day. Saul had his spear in his hand and Saul hurled the spear for he thought, I will pin David to the wall. Remember what we talked about the subconscious and the conscious mind, right? Now you understand that the Ruach of the Most High is not in Saul. So therefore these thoughts in his heart and his mind on a subconscious and conscious level, right? Are penetrating him into his very fibers acting out what is evil. So the reverse of that would be of Obviously, things that are the most high that is with penetrated into our heart and mind, conscious and unconscious, would our very fibers would actually act out the works of the fruits of wisdom in the right ways. Verse 11, and Saul hurled the spirit for he thought I will pan David to the wall, but David evaded him twice. David was quick, boy. David, David was quick. He had some, he had some feet. Um, verse 12, Saul was afraid of David because the most high was with him, but had departed from Saul. He was afraid now. He's afraid of the spirit of the most high that's in another man. He sees it. Verse 13, so Saul removed him from his presence and made him a commander of a thousand. He went out and came in before the people. So not pull him closer to him so he can, you know, do good, right? So, right, unequally yoked. So the enemy doesn't want anyone. Once he gets you, he possesses you uh, or possesses someone. He doesn't want any good, any light to penetrate. Um, so now we're going to go to verse 28. And when Saul, when Saul saw and knew that the Most High was with David, and that Michal or Michal, Saul's daughter, loved him. Saul was even more afraid of David. So Saul was David's enemy continually. So he purposed in his heart. He fully, he's like full blown obsessed and possessed with being an enemy 
to a man of the most high. It's crazy. Look at this story so much different, right? Chapter 19, verse 6. And Saul listened to the voice of Jonathan. Saul swore, as the Most High lives, he shall not be put to death. So this is after Jonathan tells Saul, why would you kill David without a cause? Like, chill out. And Saul lies and says, oh, yeah, I'm going to swear an oath unto the Most High in front of you as well that I won't kill him. And Jonathan called David. He told Jonathan or Jonathan told David everything that, that he had told Saul. And Jonathan brought David to Saul and he was in his presence as before. OK, now we go to uh, verse nine. A harmful spirit from the most high came upon Saul again as he sat in his house with his spear in his hand. And David was playing the liar. So you notice the enemy looks for an opportunity to kill, steal, and destroy. Though it's saying that the, the spirit was obviously from uh, from the Most High. The Most High has, like, there, he's always going to, he has his purpose in all things. So he's already given the kingdom over to David. So he's, clean, he's cleaning house anyway. So there's already a possession of the enemy over Saul that he's allowing his enemy to go and feast on Saul and find opportunity that the enemy wants to kill David. But he's still in the midst of all things, all things. So it may look like something is happening and the enemy is allowed to, to do, right? And that's going crazy, but just know the most high is always near. The sun is always near. The rock is always near. Um, verse 10. And Saul sought to pin David to the wall with the spear, but he eluded Saul so that he struck the spear into the wall and David fled and escaped that night. All right. And I think I have a James 5, 10 connection. 5, 12. Oh, yeah. We already read that about the oath. Let your yes be yes. No be no. All right. So now we're going to go to verse 18. Now David fled and escaped, and he came to Samuel at Ramah and told him all that Saul had done to him. And he and Samuel went and lived in Neoth. And it was told Saul, Behold, David is, David is at Naoth in Ramah. Saul sent messengers to take David, and when they saw the company of the prophets prophesying, the Samuel standing as head over them, the Spirit of the Most High came upon the messengers of Saul, and they all prophesied. When it was told to Saul, he sent other messengers, and they also prophesied. And Saul sent more messengers a third time, and they also prophesied. Then he himself went to Ramah and came to the great well that is in Saku, and he asked, Where are Samuel and David? And one said, Behold, they are at Neoth in Ramah. And he went there to Neoth in Ramah, and the Spirit of the Most High came upon him also. As he went, he prophesied. Until he came to Neoth and Ramah. And he too stripped off his clothes. He too prophesied before Samuel. And lay naked all day and all that night. Thus it is said. Is Samuel also among the prophets? So notice. The rock had left him. But then in this moment. When the spirit is heavy. When the, when the most high allowed. It allowed um, the enemy. Right. To do something that the most high allow. Uh, this is very, you can break this apart in many different ways, but the most high gets glory no matter what, whether it's things that has come about of evil because there's judgment that is involved. And there's also a chance of repentance in this moment. That's what the whole point of him laying naked is. There's a chance of repentance for him that unfortunately Saul did not also take, right? Um, which is just very interesting. It is it's gives you a chance. That's why Hebrews six is so important because it shows if you tasted of the heavenly gift, right? Reading it one more time. Hebrews six. It says in verse four, it's impossible to restore again to repentance those who have once been enlightened, have tasted the heavenly gift. 
and have shared in the Holy Spirit and the rock and have tasted the good word of the most high and the powers of the age to come and then have fallen away since they are crucifying again the son of the most high to their own harm and are holding him up to contempt. Okay, so I mean, you see it clear as day with Saul. You see it clear as day. All right. Um, and yeah, so that we're, we are finished with looking at Saul. You obviously can read more into that story, but I think we got a really good picture. Really good picture of understanding where the spirits lay within the, within the spirits of error. All right. Uh, let's see here. So now let's try to put these scriptures into context. Okay, so this is the last, very last portion. First John. Two. Sixteen through seventeen. So now I want you to focus on really seeing more spiritual warfare or more spirits that come with the enemy while the enemy is utilizing these different things in this world, right? So now we understand where the spirit of error is and we understand that there's spirits involved within the spiritual warfare. So I want you now that you know your enemy even more from the look of look at Saul's life, let's read these scriptures more in context, All right? So I'm just gonna breeze through them. First John 2, 16 through 17. Please take a screenshot of this or you want it. I can always send it. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes and the pride of life comes not from the father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of the father lives forever. So you see the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. Second Peter chapter two. And um, that last portion of Enoch, I'll I'll read that on another um, study because I don't it's, it's, it's a lot, <laughs> but I will read it next time. Second Peter, chapter two. There are also false prophets among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you. Notice that's the spirit of error behind them. They will secretly in introduce destructive heresies, even deny denying the sovereign most high who brought them, bringing swift destruction on themselves. Many will follow their depraved conduct and bring the way of truth into disrepute. In their greed, these teachers will exploit you with fabricated stories, lying. Their condemnation has long been hanging over them and their destruction has been sleeping. For if the Most High did not spare the angels when they sinned, but sent them to hell, putting them in chains of darkness to be held for judgment. If he did not spare the ancient world where he brought the flood on his ungodly people, but protected Noah, a preacher of righteousness and seven others, if he condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah by burning them to ashes and made them an example of what is going to happen to the ungodly. If he rescued Lot, a lot, a righteous man who was distressed by the depraved conduct of the lawless, lawless. <laughs> um, verse nine, if so, the most high knows how to rescue the godly from trials and to hold the unrighteous for punishment on the day of judgment. This is especially true of those who follow the corrupt desire of the flesh and despise authority. So you'll see more in this chapter. It talks about adultery, talks about celestial beings, um, arrogant, being bold. So you see all of the spiritual connections, the evil that is connected with all these things that come from the spirit of error. So now you see what to actually look for. Your eyes are actually a lot more open to understand and catch. It's ultimately a spirit of error, but these different spirits that are within people, or even if it tries to arise in yourself. Oh, let me catch that. Like, let me, you know, you understand what, where, what what's happening and that we're preventing ourselves from even getting anywhere near. And so where Saul 
or where Saul ended up being. First Timothy chapter four. The Ruach clearly says that in later times, some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. Hmm. Such teachings come through hypocritical liars whose consciousness have been seared as with a hot iron. They forbid people to marry and order them to abstain from certain foods, which the Most High receive with thanksgiving to those who believe and who know the truth. So obviously that last portion, look into, understand it, what he's talking about. But you see, there's a doctrine of demons. Chapter six now, first Timothy. I told y'all we gotta gotta learn. We gotta open up our eyes here. Um be able to learn and see what we need to be seeing. These are things you are to teach and insist on. Verse three, if anyone teaches otherwise and does not agree to the sound instruction, the wisdom of the, of the Messiah and to godly teaching, they are conceited and understand nothing. All right. So we know that the Ruach, the actual Ruach has wisdom in it, but it also has the spirit of understanding. OK, so they're teaching. Outside of understanding and conceited in their understanding. And in their approach and their teaching, you know that that's a spirit of error behind them. They have an unhealthy interest in controversies and quarrels about words that result in envy, strife, malicious talk, evil suspicions, evil suspicions and constant friction between people of corrupt mind who have been robbed of the truth and who think that godliness is a means to financial gain. OK, so. Another clear marker. You can you guys can read until verse 10. Obviously, it talks about the root. The love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. So that's also saying the love of money or anything that's outside of the most high. That's in his instructions. That's righteous is the root of all other kinds of demons of other spirits that come. To beguile in the evil that they're, they're going to be beguiling in. Second uh, Timothy, chapter two. I'm going to read all the way up until Mark chapter 13. I'm going to we're going to read the rest of it of of those chapters at the end uh, for tomorrow. Actually, I was going to do a different study, but it's very important. Those last three. Very important. So we'll get a part three tomorrow. That'll make it easier for me. <laughs> um, Second Timothy. Chapter two. Fourteen through nineteen. It says, keep reminding the most highest people of these things, warn them before the most high against quarreling about words. It is of no value and only ruins those who listen. That could also be meaning about the names of the most high. See how much quarrel has come about that. Um, do your best to present your work, your yourself to the most high as one approved, a worker who does not need to be ashamed and correctly handles the word of truth. Uh, in the BDS scripture story studies, that was the first one that we actually broke apart. Study to study, study to show yourself approved and actually what that means. So please look that up too. Um, but it talks about uh, verse 16, avoid godless chatter because those who indulge in it will become more and more ungodly. Their teaching will spread like gangrene. You look that up as well. Uh, verse 18, part B, they say that the resurrection has already taken and destroyed the faith of some. Um, yeah. Uh, part B of 19, the Most High knows who are his and everyone who confesses the name of the Messiah must turn away from wickedness. You must turn away from wickedness. The enemy does not want us to turn from it. Okay. Second Timothy chapter three, some more discernment to keep your eyes open about. Verse one through nine. 
It says, but mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. Watch all these spirits that are, are listed. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure, rather than lovers of the most high, of wisdom, having a form of godliness, but denying its power, having nothing to do, have nothing to do with such people. They are the kind who worm their way into homes and gain control over gullible women. Isn't it interesting? There's a scripture that talks about uh, demonic spirits uh, making their way into homes. Um, and it says always learning. They're swayed by all kinds of evil desires, always learning, but never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. OK, uh, part B of verse eight, their depraved minds who also as far as faith is concerned, are rejected. Okay. Um, and just, like I said, just read even more <laughs> of that. Please take a screenshot of this. Okay. Um, so that was, that's pretty much it. Um, like I said, I'll read the Apocalypse of Elijah. I'll read that connection because I think we, I mean, obviously it was a lot. A lot of understanding within this. Um, and so, um, you know, it's not by accident. I just feel the need to read the last three portions of the spiritual discernment part. So for our understanding for tomorrow, and that should take way less, should take less than an hour. <laughs> um, but I'll be able to actually close this portion on knowing our enemy, because by that time, now we understand by knowing our enemy how the spiritual warfare weapons actually will work against the attacks of the enemy. That's the whole portion. That's where the uh, Ruach was guiding me to, under, uh, to help us, you know, get our heart right, get our mind right, get our understanding right, um, counsel us on what we are actually, what type of warfare we're actually in before we just sit there and say, oh, well, yeah, pray about it. Oh, do this about it, blah, blah, blah. So it's a lot more to what this warfare is actually about. Um, and so that is it, my brothers and sisters. I will see you guys tomorrow. Um, I'll announce that time frame. But we are strictly reading these last three portions of connecting spiritual discernment. And then we will, we will be done with knowing our enemy. And um, we'll take a week off or I'll take a week off. Uh, I won't do a teaching or anything like that um, unless it may be some sharing on the stories um, so we can actually take time to study more and then understand how we go about the next portion of the warfare. So I hope you guys enjoyed that. Another long study, of course, <laughs> but I hope you guys enjoyed it. A lot of meat to chew, um, even for myself. And um, you guys have any comments, questions, concerns right now, let me know. I'll wait about 30 seconds or less. <sighs> My voice might be gone by tomorrow. Sheesh. <laughs> but without further ado, I'll go ahead and pray out. <clears throat> Go ahead and pray out. Appreciate y'all. It's I mean it's a it's it's a lot of labor in this. Um you know, I know every every teaching or whatever uh is long, but it's necessary because how how can we how can we skip anything? <laughs> so this last portion, that probably would take way more time because this is actually very it's very some very key stuff. So I think what we learned today, uh, it'll it'll be really fresh for tomorrow. And so I appreciate y'all for tuning in. Um, and just keep it fresh, keep it fresh in your mind and your rock. Um, without further ado, I'll go ahead and pray. Dear Abba, Abba Hayah, we thank you so much um, 
through you. Um, and also thank you, Messiah Yasha, for who you are, for all that you do. Um, I ask that you just continue to bless us with understanding and not just for a uh, momentary um, pleasure in our mind, momentary uh, sowing of your word. We ask that the enemy not take this, that what has been sown today in our in our hearts, our mind, that he not take this um, from us, that he may not, even though he's probably around, like a lion waiting to devour, we ask that you continue to help us escape the claws of the enemy, that we may be able to fight the enemy, because we know that David um, destroyed, or he, he destroyed the Philistine, but he also had the power to take upon lions and bears with his bare hands, even at a young age. So we ask that you give us that same strength, you give us that same power in our Ruach, that we may be able to continue to grow in what this warfare is about and what our walk is about. So that we may be equipped to do every good work, which is a part of the fruits of the wisdom, so that we may present our works unto you with first fruits, as first fruits, not as our last fruits, not as incomplete fruits, not as fruits that are not ready. But we want to present our best to you. We want to be warriors on this battlefield in our best armor that you are blessing us with. So we ask that we keep the goal in mind and we ask that you forgive us for falling short. And we continue to ask for your forgiveness and your mercy, um, your grace to be able to continue to get prepared, but also to utilize these weapons. You may utilize these, this knowledge and understanding and growth in our everyday walk that we don't um, uh, that we don't think that we have all the most time that we don't, that we have time entitled granted to us that we may work on it today. For you say you are prolong our life for those who are walking in your instruction. So we ask that you continue to uh, keep us on that right path. We love you so much. We praise your name. We praise who, what you're doing in us. And we just give you all the glory and, and, and all the praise of them. And um, we love you in the name of your son, Abba. In the name of your son, Yasha, Messiah Yasha, we pray. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> so I will see you all tomorrow. I will tell you all the time. And it will, it will be less than an hour. I know it will. Um, I, I, I promise you, I have no voice to go past an hour. <laughs> but I appreciate you guys. And um, I'll see you guys tomorrow. And some of you guys, I'll talk to you later, later today or tonight. My time, my time. See you then.